Welcome to Rebels Season 2 Thoughts. So, spoilers for everything Star Wars leading up to and including this season. And yeah, I continue to love every episode so far. This video is going to be riffs and analysis for the season, not a review. I will do a spoiler for review once I've watched all seasons. And since I won't get into the following in every single episode section in this video, I will just briefly say... Every episode so far has great creativity and designs. The action is engaging, well choreographed. I'm invested in the stories and the characters. Anything I don't comment on, pursue my approval of. Not that this is only going to be negative. And I will be talking about the messages it communicates. So, uh, there we go. Yes. So, gonna try not to... My, my timer has a proclivity for slipping, so I'm going to try to not let it. So, starting with Episode 1, The Siege of Lothal, Part 1. So, yeah, I appreciate the, the Rebels talk about how things have changed now that they've met up with the rest of the Rebel cells. Sato is positive Asian representation. Love to see it. And the minister offers imperial secrets in return for the rebels saving her. Talk to me. Open communication. A man actually sharing his feelings with his female partner. Love to see it. Minister Tua is blown up. And I'm almost certain they were framed. And they do indeed have to leave Lothal, which... I appreciate, you know, the first season they really didn't travel very far away from Lothal, having to, you know, it's it's good to, to change up the, the status quo some after you've, you know, if you, it doesn't always have to be in season two, but it's a good idea to do it in one of the seasons after season one, if season one has a, I don't want to say rigid, but a, a very specific status quo that it, it keeps to. I wish that worked for me. I wish that worked on you. That made me chuckle. Darth Vader, love to see it, and he's gonna attack Kanan and Ezra. And yeah, I'm pretty sure anyone who watched this first episode tuned in for the for the second one as well. And that brings us to episode two, The Siege of Lothal, part two. Darth Vader still loves to kill kids who could grow up to be Jedi. More Lando, love to see it. And he manages to talk them from two of the six into three of the six. And we see fascists kill and take hostage civilians who had nothing to do with the sabotage against them because they are so convinced that they are right that they don't hesitate to take extreme actions. You know, they, they believe that might makes right. And yeah, they were tracked to the fleet. It wasn't your fault. But Lord Vader won't know that. This fascist thinks there's some chance that he himself will be punished if he informs his fascist superior that they're wrong about who, not if, to punish in this kind of thing. And this kind of thing does happen under fascist rule. It takes greater courage to know when not to fight. Very true. And Vader tells Palpatine about Ahsoka Tano. And that brings us to... Episode 3, The Lost Commanders. Very tense when Kanan realizes they're clones and ignites his lightsaber. We're outnumbered, outgunned. All we have left is Guile. And Kanan tells Ezra about Order 66, the first time an animated show has a surviving Jedi talk about the tragedy of it. And, you know, I'm not expecting them to have covered that before now. I'm just saying it's good to have, you know. And... You know, a, um, a lot of these, you know, a lot of a lot of fiction focuses on the here and now th threat and and experience, but it's worth examining also what does it do in the long term. You know, what what is it like? You know, Kanan, it's it's this is you know ah crap is is this ten fifteen? I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure, but it's years. Yeah, I guess it has. Yeah, yeah, cause, cause. Let's see, how old is is Leia in this? 
teenager or twenties or something like that. So so yeah, you know, it's been it's been many years now since Order sixty six and Kanan is still understandably affected by it. You know, that's it's it's important to to communicate to, to younger audiences that that's okay. That's that's actually you know, it's it's completely understandable to still be upset about something long after it's happened. And we learn that Zeb is bait for the giant creature, not the hunter. I was inside its mouth, only fair I see how it tastes. Don't make an inappropriate joke, don't make an inappropriate joke. It's a kid's show. Moving on. So that brings us to... Episode 4, Relics of the Old Republic. These characters sure are worried about Storm. I don't know why Aurora Monroe's great, other than, you know, X-Men The Last Stand. But that's not Halle Berry's fault. I like the clone's reaction to seeing an at at for the first time. Yes, I insist on referring to it as at at not AT-AT. We only got one shot, one opportunity. And they're surrounded, very tense. And Ezra has to be the one to fire. And they go for the legs of the AT-AT, which is, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Still another Inquisitor. Very heartening when they do turn around to go back to save the clones. And Ahsoka Tano and Rex hug. Nothing worth doing is ever easy. An incredibly important message for young audiences. And that brings us to episode 5, Always True, there are. Are you saying I lack discipline? If he wasn't saying it, then your response certainly is saying it. I don't know why Lord Vader keeps sending in those mystics, because they kill in the ratings. I appreciate the episode letting the creepy abandoned base be creepy and not have them, like, yeah, actually, I feel like this season, they're, they're a little bit better at not, like, constantly reassuring. I get it. I get that the show is for kids. I'm not saying that I'm, like, expecting, you know, 1982's The Thing or something, but I love when, I believe that children can handle more, like, scary stuff than a lot of people give them credit for. I certainly remember being a kid and loving when something would actually get scary, you know, and, and they didn't feel the need to, as a lot of children's entertainment does, constantly undercut it and, and say, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, everything's okay. You know, so, yeah, I really appreciate that they do that some more in this season. Not that there wasn't anything in the first season. Another Inquisitor, and yet another. And now when they double blade spin, there's no frame skipping, so either they improve the tech or change their minds about the artistic choice from season one. Very cool that one of the Inquisitors attacks Sabine with her own grenades. It's a it's a great reversal because up to this point, Sabine is always in control when it comes to the grenades. And Zeb says he has he, you know, he is Commander Melu run, since that will make it clear to, you know, the the rebels on the receiving end that he realizes there's something going on, and he offers help, claiming he will bring Kanan and Ahsoka Tano, since all three of them know that is not going to happen. Chin up, chin up, and he notices the the ship. Great. Very cool rescue. I don't know if that makes me like you more or less. And episode six, Brothers of the Broken Horn. They're running out of batteries for the heaters that they need to survive. The Star Wars equivalent of Ted Cruz already went to Space Cancun, and nobody wants him to return for there except for the people of Space Cancun, of course. Ezra misses when things were simpler, but by the end of the episode, appreciates the new status quo. Great setup with the droids that have been turned off. We know that they're going to be turned back on. We can tell there's something off about them being off. Hondo, awesome. I will literally... Honestly, if they make a Disney Plus live-action show centered on Hondo, 
I'm just saying, I really think that would kill in the, just everyone would Does anybody not love Hondo? Like, I feel like you're either, either you love Hondo, or you have not yet been blessed with the knowledge of Hondo. It's just, I, honestly, if you don't like Hondo, I swear I'm not gonna be like, I, I just, I would be fascinated. Put it in the comments. Ex you know, just let me know why, because I would be fascinated to know, like, yeah, I, I, for me, it's really, really difficult to imagine someone not loving Hondo. Ezra claims to be Lando so that Hondo doesn't know too much about him. All the stories I could tell you, so many of them true. 500% <clears throat> markup? I guess Hondo is the Star Wars Galaxy version of Martin Shkreli. You lied to me. I knew there was something I liked about you. And Hondo is willing to sacrifice himself to save Ezra. Ezra tells Hondo his real name. It is a fair deal, and it disgusts me. Just love Hondo. Just absolutely. And I guess there is a chance that he would. He maybe he'll pop up in a Disney Plus live action show, but just, yeah, really, really love to see him. Episode 7, Wings of the Master. Very tense landing, and the engineer waits until Hera is in the air to tell them that he has never flown it. Blade is very cool. Really appreciate this episode acknowledging that some people starve to death because of a war that they aren't fighting in. You know, the the you you might think, oh well, they'll be safe. They're not fighting in the war, but that's often not the case. And episode eight, Blood Sisters are doing it for themselves. Ezra points out that Sabine is a bit of a loner. This episode explores why. And I like that he oh, he acknowledges sometimes you'll just say to me, Ezra, leave me alone. And. The courier turns out to be a gonk droid. I, I love when they do the, the thing of, you know, Star Wars has always been about the people that you might overlook. You know, our heroes are a farmer and a smuggler. You know, I'll, I'll grant that, you know, princess, okay, people think, you know, okay, she's going to be important, but you're not expecting her to run around with a blaster and, and being like a spy, you know, so... And we learned Sabine used to be a bounty hunter. Very cool when Ketsu takes out stormtroopers on her own. Chopper turned off the weapon. I really like the chess match between Sabine and, and Ketsu where they keep guessing the other's move and countering. Like, really, really, you know, a lot of the time Sabine is up against people that doesn't, that, that don't really know. You know, very frequently when they're up against the Imperial you know, they they get underestimated, or, you know, but here, straight up, like, no, 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 I, I know that's what you would do, so, that, you know, counter, yeah. And that brings us to episode 9, Stealth Strike. Which I believe is a victimless crime, because you can't see it. Triple Guard. I think we can handle one little boy. As always, arrogance is the Empire's weakness. I chuckled when I realized that Ezra had shocked Rex and Kanan, and then he tries to present he didn't, and Shopper shows the video of it. And Kanan frees Sato and the others, and he is not a little short for a stormtrooper. And Kanan rescues Rex. Love it. Fire the gravity wells! They have not met their quotas. And at the end, Kanan salutes Rex despite it all. And Rex doesn't, like, hold it over his head or anything. He just accepts it. So, great character growth. And that brings us to episode 10, The Future of the Force. Kanan knew that Ezra was listening at the door. That was kind of funny. He doesn't even claim that he wasn't dropping no eaves. And the Galactic Empire is unspeakably evil. They are probably landlords also, yes. I hope it's not a baby Inquisitor with a dual-bladed pacifier, black diaper. You could 
pinch his little pale cheeks as the red eyes fill with love. I th yeah, honestly, the, the <laughs> toys of it would probably sell, let's be honest. Baby Hunter, very funny. And the Inquisitor's attack, uh, attacks through the floor and door, very tense and, you know, air quotes scary. It's a s scary for kids. In a way that, again, you know, instead of like, oh, the, then the Inquisitor gets hit in the head, and you know, like, no, it's it's just allowed to to sit. I really love that. And the Inquisitors hope to take Ahsoka to Anakin, and they hear because of the droid that Garel is where to go to follow. That brings us to episode. 11 legacy it can mean something good something bad but both I really appreciate that Ezra does not get his parents back obviously that would be a really crowd-pleasing reassuring thing to do but people die especially doing rebel activities like this and there was a connection before the parents died because of Ephraim's message which already was an important character moment for at least this one's transmission he is the voice of the rebellion he used phrases his parents taught him also, it wouldn't be Star Wars unless somebody had lost their father under tragic circumstances. Not always to death, but they always lose their father or father figure. So Ezra's father's name is Ephraim. Ezra and Ephraim are both Hebrew names, so I really appreciate this bit of representation. You know, I could easily imagine, like, some, some kids with name, either one of those two names or similar names, you know, becoming more popular around the other kids after this episode aired and that brings us to episode 12 a princess on lethal very cool to see leia and i'm very impressed with both the writing which really does feel like this is stuff that could have been like deleted scenes from the original trilogy and the voice actress who does a very good job imitating the very specific voice of carrie fisher r.i.p you could say that they nail the voice in both aspects. Well, excuse me, princess. I had to. You know I had to. I like Leia explaining why the ship exchange has to go the way it does, and she's not written to be some genius who never makes a mistake. She underestimated the security of the Empire, and instead of getting defensive, as many people do when they make a mistake, she fixes things. And again, very, very good message for the kids. <clears throat> And Zeb, of course, needs a little excuse to hit Kanan and Ezra. At least now you know, and knowing is half the battle. I appreciate Leia comforting Ezra. And Kanan makes, like, Empire Strikes Back, trips an at, -AT. And Leia tells Ezra... Let's see... Yeah, he can use the, the stun setting on her to make it look good, and he gladly obliges... And episode 13, The Protector of Concord, Dawn. Diplomacy or Strength. Hero really did get hurt. Again, appreciate that in a, you know, not immediately, like, reassuring the kids. And Kanan wants to hire the Mandalorians. Very tense when Kanan is on the, the ship and... And Kanan grabs him and explains why. Really, really great to, to see. And that brings us to the next episode. Episode 14, Legends of the Lasat. Other Lasat. Lasats. And Hondo is proud and gets a reward from Imperials. He's basically playing both sides for his benefit. And he gets caught and we learn that he is the warrior, which... Like, yeah, Zeb is like, yeah, I don't want to be the child. You're acting like the child. Or you sound like the child right now, something like that. Great ending to episode. And, yeah, you know, I always appreciate when the media takes, like, you know, this this is the kind of thing that for, you know, they're, for a long time, American media would mock any, you know, religious belief that didn't align with their own. And so here you have something, you know, and, and Zeb himself isn't a big fan of these, you know, 
these old beliefs, but it ends up, you know, turning out to be completely true. And, you know, yeah, that can, again, encourage some kids who've been taught to believe things that the, the you know, the, that other, uh, other kids don't believe. Now, ultimately, you know, I think it would be good for them to to at some point question the the beliefs but you know until you turn 18 as long as you have to live under your parents roof you know going along with what they believe is in some cases the the you know the way to what's what's the phrase go along to get along that brings us to episode 15 the call This isn't the strangest thing we've done. Okay, TMI. Kanan bickering with Hira is pretty funny. This episode, even though I know usually I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of it, but... And Ezra realizes the Pergil want the fuel. He looks out for the little guy. He used to be the little guy. At the very start of the show, he was only looking out for himself, but he's grown. Not many centimeters, but a lot as a character. Why is there no explosion? For this scene, the character of Zeb will be played by Sabine. So this episode is basically stay, save the space whales. I approve. Very tense when Ezra loses the gun, saved by a purgle, and communicates with it something extremely important in changing relationships from negative to positive. It cannot speak galactic basic, but it can hand him his helmet back to show it agrees. You know, it's not going to do that, like, randomly. I love when the purgle joined the fight and... Then they fly into hyperspace, Hira underestimated them, and changes her perspective. You gotta be careful not to misunderestimate people, or creatures. Episode 16, Homecoming. The crew meet Hera's father, Cham Sindula, who we, the viewer, already know. And Kanan is so nervous, so determined to make a good impression, he accidentally mixes up Ezra and Sabine when introducing... The Empire is still trying to figure out how to beat me. Badass. Very realistic father-daughter conflict. I love the detail that Hira gets some of her accent back when talking to him. Very much something that happens. And the fact that she's worked to get rid of her accent shows that she feels some, if not shame, at least frustration with her heritage. The plan seemed to be working out well, but then Cham and his allies stun the crew. And not with the you know, some some show of intelligence, but with stun settings on blasters. Ezra pulls off a successful mind trick, and because he's so excited about it, he has the captain of the Imperial Vessel say some things that really should reveal that it's a kid feeding lines. This is really the captain, but under a you know, fascist dictatorship, people are afraid to argue with their you know, supposed superiors, so yeah. Torpedoes! Bummer. I mean, bummer. Great when Hera and Cham work together again. Foolish. Yet again, the Empire loses because of arrogance. The farewell between Hera and Cham is positive, so there is at least one positive father kid relationship in Star Wars now. I suppose the, you know, the one between Vader and Luke ends positively, but only for like... 30 seconds, and then death. And that brings us to episode 17, The Honorable Ones. Very tense when we realize it's a trap. Zeb versus Callus in the pod. And they end up stuck together, marooned on the moon. Great episode, although obviously not quite as good as the Deep Space Nine episode that's similar, but I'm not... You know, that, that would be very unfair to... to you know... To, to think something is bad just because it doesn't live up to DS9. And, of course, it takes the two no time to start arguing about politics every Thanksgiving, I swear. And we learn there's a creature in the cave. Callus has to decide whether to shoot the creature or Zeb. And Zeb points out he needs to, you know, Callus needs to question this. He's just asking questions. 
We learned the Catalyst was gifted the weapon. A lot of great character moments this episode. They gradually develop mutual respect. Not all of us are the same. There are four lights and two creatures. Callus chooses to shoot the creature, even though he could easily let Zeb fall. Callus reveals he did not approve of killing of Lasats the way that they did it. Two seconds too long. I'm pretty sure that was the original title for the second Fast and Furious movie. And the episode ends with Callus in in thought in his room. And episode 18, Shroud of Darkness. Dang, Ferry, talk about opening your episode in media res. I'm more into brains, and the droid crawls on the top of his head. Very creepy, love it. You know, let's be honest, Star Wars has always been creepy. There's always been some creepy stuff in Star Wars. You know, in the first one, you've got the the creature in the in the trash compactor. You know, keep in mind, like the trash compactor, that's already kind of scary. But the creature in there, and you just see the eye, and it's like pulling people underwater, you know, that's creepy. And it wouldn't have been difficult to not have that in the movie. Ahsoka Tano is haunted by the idea she could have helped Anakin not become Darth Vader. And Kanan fears Ezra embracing the dark side. And that brings us to episode 19, The Forgotten Droid. So this episode, Shopper wants a new leg. I love that they put the action scene in the background of Shopper trying to buy the leg. This episode is about Shopper, not the rest of the crew, and there's tons of episodes that focus on the crew and their missions. Shopper shares his story. Oh, right, and the, yeah, the seller is like, I'm, I'll, you know, I won't ask her for too high a price for this leg. It won't cost you an arm and a leg, and it's like, that's like, that is the worst pun I've heard in a long time, and I love it. And Shopper shares a story about Hira rescuing him in the war, bonding with AP5, and gets AP5 to use his free will. Not everyone who is currently aligned with fascist ideology is unreachable. Shopper waves at the stormtroopers, runs away with them chasing him. I love how Benny Hill was gone. I half expected Yakety Sax to start playing, or the Star Wars equivalent. Shopper trapped all of the stormtroopers in the cargo hold, which AP5 had just told him and us there was no way out of other than that one door, and then he dumps the cargo. I love Shopper and AP5 arguing over who should be captain. Like, you know, AP5 is like, oh, come on. I, you know, clearly you are not qualified to be captain. I should be captain. No, the captain should not be the person who makes it into the captain's chair first. You know, and of course, yeah, you know, the, the let's see, I guess he's, he's not a protocol director. I, I, he says what he is. I forget what it is, though. I mean, no disrespect, but Shopper, as an astromech, can move faster. You know, he's he's supposed to be able to move on the outside of starships flying through space. So, yeah, he's he's... You know, although I suppose that doesn't need... No, yeah, yeah, you need to be relatively fast to even get onto the... Anyway, yeah. The, the, yeah, and, and, you know, once they get there, you know, when, when AP5 gets there, we see that he can joke as well. You know, he drops the leg and says, I'm the captain now. What? You abandoned your post. And Ketsu helps the rebels, love to see it, and Hira talks to Shopper, is angry at him, so instead of calling him Shopper, she calls him by what is evidently his original droid call sign. C-110P! Like how in Season 1 she did that with Zeb. Shopper doesn't have any friends. Yeah, that's harsh. But I guess possibly true, he's not the most... He's, he's not the most happy, bubbly person, so... And AP5 proves he is Shopper's friend by talking about details of the rescue. Legitimately sad when AP5 is shot, and Shopper holds his hand as he dies. Like, honestly, I did. I was sitting there, like, thinking, oh no, you did not do that to my man. You did not just kill such a fun character. 
And then we learn Chopper gave up the leg in order to save AP5, who is super ungrateful in response. Like, see, I told you you weren't logical. No, if you were logical, you would not have given up your own leg just to save me. You know, they have a very real C3PO R2D2 dynamic, and I hope we get more of them together in the the season after this. It's not, you know, there there is a little bit more in this season, but yeah. One of oh. That brings us to the next episode, the episode 20, The Mystery of Chopper Base. One more run. Are you only sending the men to get Melu run? Is it going to be a male Melu run run? Since when are you my enemy? I mean, that's a really long list. Let's start by you listening at the door all the time. AP5 and Chopper are both frustrated by the organics, just like C3PO and R2D2. And yes, I am continuing to call him Chopper because I find that to be a very funny nickname by Zeb. Very creepy, massive spiders. I met the neighbors. I don't like them. And I thought a partying Zac Efron was bad. Eight Legged Freak Star Wars Edition. I'm here for it. It gives me life. Alas, poor Sabine, they did not throw her well. Accidentally throwing her too far. I appreciate that the, the episode lets the tension sit for a minute, doesn't immediately reveal that she survived. I appreciate that Kanan does try to tend to Hera's emotions, as everyone should with their partner. She does not think they should split up the team. And dark music right before the episode ends, implying something bad will happen before they see each other again. Yeah, I guess the... Yeah, the last two episodes of the season, they have, they are split. And that brings us to part one of the finale, episode 21, Twilight of the Apprentice, part one. There's always a bit of truth. Oh, oh hold on. In my book, experience outranks everything. Very, yeah, a lot of the time that is something I agree with. There's always a bit of truth in legend, so if hypothetically a massive corporation bought a beloved franchise and then said a huge chunk of that franchise was now legends, it does not mean that you should stop supporting that massive corporation with your money. And we learn it's a Sith temple. Forbidden knowledge, eh? Prepare to eat an apple. Wait, if an apple a day keeps the doctor away, does that mean the doctor doesn't like smart patients? And the Inquisitor hid by pretending to be one of the Scorched Earth victims. I love that, like, we as the viewer can just, you know, it's 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 there. We can, we can pick that up, and it doesn't take the episode, like, forever to reveal it. To... Now, let's see, and... Ezra, you're developing a really bad habit this episode of falling from floor. Ezra meets Maul, who tells him of all the Sith took from him, which leads Ezra to trust him turning off the lightsaber, walking in front of him after he was very specifically not going to do that. And it doesn't immediately lead to something bad, but we can tell that it will. So they have to open one door at a time, and it takes two, the Sith way. Ezra and Maul tell each other their real names, and it did legitimately look like Maul was just going to take the holocron from Ezra's handle and let him fall. Very, very tense. More Inquisitors, Ahsoka Tano recognizes them all, he chuckles, and the episode ends. And that brings us to the finale, episode 22, Twilight of the Apprentice, part 2. This episode is full of, of great fights. Love Maul versus the three Inquisitors. Not really a fan, at least so far. Maybe they'll fix it later, but... So far, not really a fan of the helicopter spinning for the Inquisitors to fly. I don't mind Inquisitors flying. I just think it's... <sighs> I know, Star Wars, the galaxy, not the same as ours. But, like, they, you know, gravity is real in Star Wars, and I just, I don't completely buy that they could fly with just with with sabers spinning like that like you know like yeah i already mentioned you know, it's somewhat similar to like a helicopter you know a helicopter it's not just like this thing spinning there's like an engine making sure that the the spinning is fast enough 
you know, yeah, I, just, I, I wish they had just given them some, I get that jetpacks are more of a Mandalorian thing and occasionally a clone trooper thing, but yeah, it's, it looks a little silly to me. And I, I do very much approve of the saw that's apparently also on Inquisitor. Like, you know, Ezra is like hanging on for dear life, and you know the Inquisitor turns off the the the, the lightsaber blade, and then you you know there's a spinning saw blade that was really really cool. And I really appreciate that Maul has become complex between Clone Wars and this. You know, he, he always had a cool design, a cool lightsaber, cool th moves with the with the saber and all, but he used to be a very one-note character. Now, let's see. And the... Um, okay, I'm gonna see if I can... Figure. Oh, right, right. Finish her. Friendship? Nope. Fatality. Try, fly, die. I mean, the the Inquisitor tries to fly, and the blade turns out, and she pretty sure he, she falls to her death. So that's again, love how dark this gets. Something Star Wars has always been, even though you know, like George Lucas has said, he makes the movies for twelve-year-olds, which. You know, I, I really appreciate people who take 12-year-olds seriously. There's so much American media that just says, if you're not 18 yet, you're an idiot, and you don't understand anything. And George Lucas is someone who says, no, that's just not true. Let's, you know, let's make some movies that they can watch and they can learn from. And we learn that it's a battle station. And... The temple speaks, and it has the voice of Asajj Ventress. I want to start by saying I love her voice. I think she's incredibly talented, but given that it's not supposed to be the same character, like, Asajj, I mean, she abandoned the Sith, so she's not, at, at this point in the timeline, she's not a, a Sith, so it's it can't possibly be her. I, I don't know if I, I want to say her name. I believe the actress's name is Mika Futterman. You know, may, I, maybe they really badly wanted to work with her again, and it's just that's what comes out when she tries to do a sinister voice. It, I, I felt it was a little distracting. And Darth Vader fighting Ezra. Very, very cool. And Ezra's lightsaber lost. Revenge is not the Jedi way, unless you prefer the original title of Return of the Jedi. And, yeah. Um, James Earl Jones' voice, still amazing, still just, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and Kane and is, you know, his, his eyesight. Yeah. You know that that is a a very you know I, I appreciate when they when they really change the the status quo like that and it could also encourage young audiences to have more empathy for you know the 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 blind and those of, of limited sight. Now let's see. Um, Think. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, some critics think that this ep this season has boring episodes. I mean, I didn't think any of them were, were boring, but they did say that the the finale surpasses any Star Wars animated episode before it. Let's see. Right. So. Yeah, um, whether we're talking the overall season, the season finale, or the season opener, you know, I love all of them, but yeah, I, I continue to feel that 
they get better as you know each one is better than the last so each season of clone wars is better than the last and yeah so far that's also how i feel about these two seasons of rebels i'm not saying they're better in every way but personally like they yeah it, they just they really really worked for me and that is what i had for this one so yeah uh let's see i believe the next one is i can find it real quick yes the next one will be in two weeks but tomorrow i'll be talking about the next episode of the true lies um tv show episode four and Thursday, I'll talk about episode two, season one, episode two of Scream Queens. And I am doing a movie Saturday, I guess, just in case. I don't want to risk jinxing it, so I'm not going to say which movie. But, yeah, that is it for this one. So, yeah, um, really looking forward to season three and I'm one of the lucky ones I don't have to wait you know months and months for the next season to start airing I I'll probably start watching tomorrow possibly later today we'll we'll see and I've heard that like season three and season four are some of the best of, of rebels so yeah really looking forward to that so that's it for the video may the force be with you